Hey everybody, this is Aubrey Chavez from Faith Matters. When Lenore Skenazy's son was nine, he asked her repeatedly if she would let him have a solo adventure in their hometown of New York City. Her son had a specific plan for this adventure. He wanted her to take him somewhere new in the city and then let him find his own way home. So Lenore took the leap of faith, and when her son burst into their apartment later, she says he was practically levitating with pride and joy at what he had accomplished. Lenore then wrote an article in the New York Sun called Why I Let My Nine-Year-Old Ride the Subway Alone, and a media firestorm ensued. We'll let Lenore share more about that particular time, but she realized then how radical and important an idea it was for modern parents to let go. In 2017, Jonathan Haidt, co-author of The Coddling of the American Mind, reached out to Lenore with two others, all of whom shared concerns about the increasing fragility they're seeing in young people in America and the poor outcomes that follow. And then they went on to launch Let Grow, a nonprofit organization that promotes childhood independence. Lenore's message is that parents can sometimes become compulsive about protecting their children from every possible danger, but blind to the trade-offs, decreased independence, resilience, social skills, and creativity, and increased anxiety and depression. But this message also has broader implications for our lives and our faith. While we often tend to try to micromanage everything with the mistaken belief that we can prevent anything bad from happening, deep faith can help us to see that there's something bigger going on and that we don't always need to be in control. We found Lenore to be so delightful. She's sharp, funny, and has profoundly important things to say for anyone interested in helping our next generations to be resilient and happy. And we really hope that you enjoy this conversation. Well, Lenore, thank you. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, well, it's really an honor to have you on. I'm happy to be here. Yeah, well, that's <laughs> I'm, true. I, I'm in my apartment, but I am happy to be with you. <laughs> yes, thank you so much. Um, this is We expect that this is going to be a fascinating conversation. Uh, your work and the what your work addresses um has been on our minds for a long time we're parents of of young children and yeah. we're young? Like, uh 15 to 6 so we've got four in that in that range we we thought an interesting place to start could you just tell your story a little bit and how you got into this work yeah i can uh, so the the origin story is pretty straightforward when our younger son was nine he started asking me and my husband if we would take him someplace he'd never been before here in New York City, where we live. <laughs> you can't tell, but that is New York City behind <laughs> me. And um, and let him find his own way home by the subway. Uh, it was his dearest wish. He kept nudging us. And finally, we said yes. I took him to Bloomingdale's one day, fancy schmancy department store in a fancy schmancy neighborhood. And I left him there after telling him that was that was the plan. <laughs> you know, it wasn't like he didn't know where I was. Um, and I went out one door and he went into the subway, which is right underneath Bloomingdale's. That's why we chose it. And he took the subway down to 34th Street, which everybody's heard of because of the miracle. And uh, and then he had to take a bus across town. And he came into our apartment just levitating with pride and excitement. And, you know, just the the fun part of being a kid is when you start growing up. I mean, like you remember, you know, when you rode your bike, not all the years that you had the the, the training wheels on. So um, so I'm a newspaper columnist. I wrote a column why I let my nine-year-old ride the subway alone. And two days later, I was on the Today Show, MSNBC, Fox News, and NPR, Fox News and NPR, <laughs> um, <laughs> defending myself. And I got wow. the nickname America's Worst Mom for what it's worth. Now I love it. I mean, the, 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 the <laughs> nine-year-old is 25. I've been living with this nickname for a while. Yeah. <laughs> and, and that weekend, I started a blog, and I called it Free Range Kids. And I started a blog because that's where you get to say what you want to say without somebody saying, but what if something horrible happened or why didn't you care about your child? Oh, I don't care. I've got another son at home. Um, and and so anyway, so I wrote, then I ended up writing the book, Free Range Kids. And now I'm the president of a nonprofit called Let Grow, not Let's Go, not <laughs> Let It Go, even though that would be better because everyone would be singing about us. It's just called Let Grow because our belief is that uh, when parents let go, they also let grow. And so we're trying to make it easy, normal, and legal to give kids back some old-fashioned independence. How how counterculture at the time did you feel like that experience was? Have have things changed? It sounds like that was 16 years ago. It was 16 years ago. It's 25. How counterculture? Well, I can tell you that two years in a row, I was voted the, what is it? Oh, the most controversial mommy blogger. And <laughs> last week, uh, the Canadian Pediatric Society, which is like the American Academy of Pediatrics, but smaller, <laughs> um, just came out with a uh, white paper that said children need risky play. And this was this was a uh, there'd been a blue ribbon commission in Canada in 2015 
that basically said the same thing it was all these psychologists and sociologists and doctors together thinking about what's going on. Kids need more play. They're not playing enough. And at that point, even that point, which is what, um, nine years ago, the, the, uh, you know, the official society of pediatricians would not sign that. Even though some of the pediatricians had been on the panel, they just, nobody could endorse the idea of risky play, unsupervised play. Oh my God. And now they are. In fact, now they're saying like, you got to give it to kids <laughs> for their mental and their physical, and I'd say their social health as well. And so I, you know, we might be at a tipping point, but there's countervailing winds. And do you think this is just a pendulum swing that is natural and will keep happening throughout time? Or did something <laughs> happen 40 years ago? Like what we're, what, what we're calling free range parenting, probably our grandparents just called parenting. So what, what do you think happened? What changed that made us so anxious and, and helicoptery about our kids or, or what made us yeah. start defining that as good parenting? Oh yeah. Um, I, first of all, I think you're right that um, what we're calling free range parenting or what let grow is promoting is something not new in this world. And in fact, what's new is the last 40 years or so of parents feeling increasingly like anytime they weren't with their kids, their kids were in automatic danger of being kidnapped, raped, and eaten, or God forbid, falling behind the other third graders, you know? And yeah. so we were told that every moment that we're not with them is bad. And every moment that we're with them, we're giving them the gift of safety. And because we're adults and we can make all these moments teachable, um, that they were also getting more intellectual stimulation that would eventually end up with them in the C-suite of some Fortune 500 company. What changed is uh, in the 80s, I'd say is where I, kids have been getting less and less independence even since the 50s, but mm -hmm. things really took a nosedive in the 80s for a couple of reasons. Uh, one is that there were a couple of high profile kidnappings, um, and one of those was Adam Walsh. Uh, his dad is John Walsh, who started America's Most Wanted. And when there was a, um, a, a, a mini series done about uh, his uh, disappearance and murder, which was just so horrible, it broke all ratings records. And, you know, TV is not there to inform you. TV is there to make money. And when executives see that something is a really big eyeball getter, eyeballs equal, you can, the more people who watch a show, the more you can charge for advertising. And so they started saying, get me more of them. And I think Law and Order heard the clarion call and said, get you more. We'll start a whole series called Law and Order SVU. So you had you had um, the sort of obsession with child kidnapping turn into a sort of franchise for television. And that was also the same era that we got the milk carton kids. Do you, I don't know mm -hmm. if you guys are old enough yes. to remember. Yeah, yes. absolutely. Well, and um, the, you know, first of all, it's horrible that anything terrible it would ever happen to any child but then they're making you afraid that this is common and what they never put was a little asterisk that said p.s of the vast majority of the kids you're seeing on the side here um, are runaways or were taken in custody disputes between two divorced mm -hmm. parents so yeah. you get the impression that all these children were kidnapped and in fact there were there were wrong numbers that were being bandied about uh, it doesn't even matter but they were Mm -hmm. uh, Congress heard that there were 50,000 children kidnapped and murdered every year. And, and frankly, the actual number of kidnappings by strangers is a, somewhere between, it's about 110 is what the FBI thinks now. And of that 90% get home, thank God, safely. So that's the, the numbers, US. that's in the United States. Okay. Yeah. Um, anyways, the numbers were really off and the perception was even more off. And, and I just have to say one other thing. I was just writing a story Um hoping to get it published somewhere, hint, hint, Salt Lake Tribune, um, about <laughs> the, the numbers. Like, there was a there was a child that was kidnapped by a stranger this summer in upstate New York, and thank God found safe. Uh, but all the newspapers and magazines and online, everybody uh, said, and every year, 460,000 children go missing. And so I looked up that number, like, where do we get that particular number? And, and it turns out it comes from a Department of Justice study from like 2018, and they had asked people, like a random sampling of people, has your child ever gone missing? And and a lot of people obviously said yes. And then they said, How, you know, tell us about the circumstances. And one was like, I thought she was at the beach, but it turned out she was at home. So we went looking for her and she wasn't there. Or my kid got <laughs> off at the wrong bus stop and took an extra 10 minutes to get home. Uh, missing was defined as any child who was missing for an hour <laughs> or more. Whoa. And had nothing to do with the circumstances or how quickly after that they were found. 
So the numbers are off, the perception is off, and then we got the idea of stranger danger, and then kids were taught stranger danger, those kids are adults mm -hmm. now. So it was all, um, it was media centric, I would say. One of, the, one of the reasons that we're so afraid is that the media really pushed us in the wrong direction. But there are a couple of other reasons too. Um, in a litigious society like ours, you start thinking, is this you know, safe enough. Could I be blamed? You know, kids have to sign. <laughs> There's somebody who told me that they had to sign a waiver for their kid to go to the neighbor's house and jump on a trampoline, which sounds both crazy and sane. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah. it's yeah. like, I, I would never do that, but I would do that, but I wouldn't do that. That's crazy. <laughs> but on the other hand, you know, so when you live in a litigious society, you start thinking like that, right? Like, does this make sense? Could, what would I say to the judge? And then you have a society that sort of normalizes the idea that you can make everything absolutely safe. And so you have like the Consumer Product Safety Commission takes things off the market. I mean, my favorite example was they they recalled 140,000 children's sweatshirts and everyone goes, oh, because there were pull strings, you know, drawstring. No, 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 not in this case. It was in this case, it was because the, 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 the pull at the bottom of a zipper, whatever that word is, that little thing at the bottom of a zipper fell off of one. And once the company is alerted by somebody who's annoyed, who probably just wants their money back, then they have to treat it as a, what? Choking hazard? Choking hazard, yay! Oh my goodness. <laughs> yes, they treat it as a choking hazard. And so wow. then, how, however ridiculous it sounds, they have to recall all those. I'm sure they're hoping that nobody notices the recall, nobody brings it back to Target. But... Their lawyers tell them, look at if this, if there's a, a loose part on something that is, you know, for a child, you cannot have that. And so then it starts seeming like, well, is everything a choking hazard? You know, is, is mm -hmm. nothing safe enough? So that's, that's part of the sort of the way we started to look at society. It just, it just, it just by degrees, it starts making you a little more paranoid. And then you get yeah. expert culture. Experts are always telling you're doing it wrong. And it starts when you're pregnant and there's those books that tell you exactly what to eat and never touch a piece of, you know, tuna fish or salami, or I don't even know what's on the list now, cheese. Once again, it's that, it's that there's something, I, I want to call it sort of OCD-ish. We don't seem to be able to distinguish between um, very safe, but not perfectly safe, and very yeah. dangerous. And because we can't, we go through these sort of compulsive things where like, well, I will be safe if I don't eat the tuna and if I microwave the, the deli meat. When you can't distinguish, when, when you can't see any nuance between um, very safe and, and completely dangerous, mm -hmm. um, then you feel compelled to take all sorts of uh, strange new behaviors to make sure that you could never blame yourself. Right. or something going wrong. And frankly, I, I keep my copy of um, what to expect when you're expecting over here because I blame them because mm -hmm. there's a whole chapter in there on what to eat. And one of the things it says is if you, you know, every forkful is a chance for you to give your child a better, you know, a better life. And how how cruel that is to anybody whose kid isn't perfect, which is, by the way, all of us, because mm -hmm. it's it's back on the mom. So there's just this piling of guilt upon moms. And then there's also this sense of control that if you pay enough attention and you buy enough uh, organic food and you enroll the child in enough classes and you track their every move and grade and temperature, of course, you're going to start acting like a crazy person if the culture is telling you only crazy people keep their kids alive. And that's where we're at. Yeah. I, there's somewhere that maybe it's in the in, in the book where you talk about how the the easiest dollar to everybody knows <laughs> the easiest dollar to get is from a worried parent. And I, I feel that in myself, like there's something so promising about just the instant relief of feeling like, OK, you did all you could do. And so but then we're just bombarded with these lists of things that you can do. And and you write that there's really no way to totally this is what you're just saying. There's no way to totally discount fear. And so you're kind of always in this trap of trying to at least mitigate the risk to the maximum amount, which, which is a trade-off. And I think that's what was so illuminating about your book, that there is a trade-off. It's not just that you get to buy safety or buy peace of mind because you're really, you're giving away something else. And so, so um, I, I would love to just start into that. Like what, what are mm -hmm. you hoping? I mean, what do we have to lose when we really control for every risk? And when we know where we are, our kids are every second and, and we, 
become determined to make sure that there's nothing in their path that could cause harm. Like when, when we, when that becomes our mission to protect at all costs, what are we really giving away? Um, well, first of all, just because you mentioned path, it reminds me of there is, you know, there's some ancient wisdom floating around about this. And there's the saying that says, um, don't prepare the path for your child, prepare your child for the path. When we're trying, isn't that great? Yes. That's really good. Yeah. That's so yeah. good. <laughs> it's so pithy. Yeah. And so the point is that when you're, when you're preparing the path, when you're clearing all the obstacles, I mean, one of the phrases now is snow plow parents or curling parents up in Canada, you know, just sweeping everything away. Um, what does your child learn? Uh, your child doesn't learn how to, you know, deal with anything that might impede them and that leaves them helpless, right? So you're actually, whereas if you're preparing your child for the path, you're getting them ready, which has always been a parent's job. A parent's job has always been to prepare their child for the world and to teach them great lessons that will keep them safer, right? Like, don't get in a car with anybody who says get in, um, you know, don't go walk with somebody. Uh, you know, look both ways before crossing the street. So I'm not saying don't be a parent to your child and don't instruct them, but you do these things and then you gradually step back so that your kid can take to the path. And um, when you ask what is the trade-off, as the decades have been going by uh, from the 50s till now, the amount of independence, you know, freedom, uh, freedom to walk around, freedom to decide what they're going to do with their time, all that has been going down for kids. Unsupervised time and free play have been going down. And as those have been going down, uh, depression and anxiety have been going up. Mm -hmm. And Peter Gray, who is one of the co-founders with me of Let Grow, who you should have on this podcast, he's so great. Uh, he's a professor of psychology at Boston College, and he spent most of his life studying the importance of mixed ages playing together. And he says that, you know, with the independence going down and anxiety and depression going up, it's not just correlation. It's not not just like, you know, people eating candy bars and the number of people on the moon. It just has nothing to do with that. It is that we're all, there's something called an, a, a, a locus of control. Who controls your life? And if it's, if you feel like you're sort of capable of doing things and if bad things happen, you'll be able to get over them. You know, it won't be easy, but you sort of have some faith in your abilities um, that's an internal locus of control. You feel pretty competent mm -hmm. and resourceful. An external locus of control is when somebody else is controlling your life. And we all know that feeling because anytime you've had like a terrible manager, <laughs> a micromanager at work, you know how just enraging it is. It's like, I was about to do that, or I know how to do that, or that part doesn't matter. You're just, you're just champing at the bit because somebody doesn't recognize your capabilities and they think that they have to do everything themselves because you're an idiot and mm -hmm. um it it it's demoralizing and we've given kids an external locus of control by saying okay honey i'll pick you up at three and then i'm going to take you to soccer and then jim will be the coach and he'll watch you and then i'll pick you up and then we'll go home we're going to do the homework i'll watch your homework dad's going to time you for the reading log then you go to bed after you've had your you know healthy snack and brushed your teeth for three minutes with the timer and then you're going to wake up and i'm going to get you ready because you're so slow and then i'm going to take you to school where you'll have seven hours of somebody else telling you what to do and then we'll go back to soccer so that's not much of an internal sense of control right? So um, that's what we're losing when you say, what does it mean if we're mm -hmm. watching our kids every second to make them safe, to make sure that no, one of the things we're trying to do with that constant supervision is also make sure that they're not wasting any of their time, right? I mean, they're going straight from school to soccer and they're doing their homework in the backseat or they're watching an educational video or whatever it is. Just we're so worried that any time that they might just be poking their way, you know, riding their bikes aimlessly, you know, going to the park with a friend and they never actually start the, the ball game because they're arguing the whole time about the rules or about, you know, who goes first. That strikes us because we're adults and we watch it as stupid wasted time, you know? And, <laughs> and so if you're with your kid, you will always jump in. Oh, my God, you know, quit arguing. You're going to go first, but then you get two turns, right? That'll be fair because I'm Solomon. But the, but the point is that in the arguing, in the coming up with a solution, in the frustration, 
in the creativity that it requires to come up with a, something that works for both of you in making sure that the other person is happy enough so that they will play with you. That's incredibly important. It's, it's vital childhood education, but it doesn't have the word education <laughs> over it. And it doesn't have a teacher and it doesn't have a trophy or a star or a grade. And so we, we discount it and we think it's the wasted time on the way to something valuable, but it turns out to be not wasted. And yet we don't recognize it. So we've taken it out of kids' lives. And then we wonder why they're doing why, why do that, you know, why are employers complaining that, oh my God, these new employees need everything explained to them? It's like, well, because mm -hmm. they've had every single thing explained to them all along the way. Yeah. yeah. What about the idea? And I'm trying to think of like what the response might be from someone who does want to do a little bit more like hands-on parenting. And I'm wondering if if one of those responses might be, well, I, I need to protect my kid from like the worst case outcomes. Like there are certain things that will like derail their lives permanently. You know, if they're getting into drug addiction or I don't know, crime of some kind or yeah, just like yeah. these big bad things. And like mm -hmm. if I am, uh, you know, snow plowing ahead of them or, or if I'm sort of like keeping an eye on them at every moment, I'm like you said, shuttling them from soccer and making sure mm -hmm, the homework's there, mm -hmm. like they're going to end up with an education they're going to end up with a reasonably healthy body. Um, and at 18, I am going to sort of turn them loose. And then there's time for them to get that internal locus of control. But I did my job. They're reasonably, they're reasonably healthy and ready to enter the world and learn those, learn those lessons. What's, what's wrong with that, with that idea? Well, I don't think there's much wrong with a lot of what you said. I think it's great. I mean, you do want to be paying attention to your kids. <laughs> you do want to keep the lines of communication open you know, if you see something troubling happening, you know, you should definitely talk to them and intervene when necessary. But the idea that if they're constantly watched, they're going to be safe. And uh, first of all, the idea that they're either constantly watched or constantly not watched is once again, this, this weird bifurcation of two extremes. So you don't need that. Um, but as I was saying earlier, the idea that, you know, if they're constantly watched, that's how they're going to be safe. We've just seen that as they got more and more constantly watched, other bad things crept in. And it's sometimes it's like, it's easier to imagine the kidnapping than it is to imagine the diabetes that kids are getting because they're so <laughs> sedentary or the obesity or, mm. or the depression or the anxiety. You know, I've looked at like actual graphs of, you know, uh, first of all, surveys that have been done over time. So you can actually see changes because it's the same survey. And then also hospital admissions for self-harm. and uh, anxiety and depression are going up. So, you know, you can protect your kids from one thing doesn't mean, you know, there's always this trade off. Are you protecting them from the other? You're protecting them from the very off chance of kidnapping and you're not protecting them from the very likely chance of, you know, heightened anxiety. Yeah. yeah. I wanted to ask about a specific thing that I'm seeing too going on in the media now that may be different than the milk cartons from 30 years ago. And it's, th there's a lot of talk and political talk specifically about sex trafficking these days, um, yeah. especially, and I, to be totally transparent, I haven't seen the movie Sound of Freedom. I I've haven't seen, seen the, it. I mean to see it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I've yeah. seen that. Well, it's interesting because um, Tim Ballard and um, Operation Underground Railroad are based here in Utah, have been based here in Utah. Um, so there's definitely been a lot of talk about it here. When I watched the trailer to the movie, it seemed like it was giving the impression uh, that, you know, a child might be, you know, taken from their beds at any moment and put into a and put into a sex trafficking sex trafficking ring. Um, you know, they might be taken out of state or out of the country or or whatever. Um, and there's also, like I said, the sort of this political element to it where, like, uh, you know, one party kind of feels like they're the ones that have to um, that have to handle this because it is a huge problem. The other and the others. The other party may not just not care, but my, you know, in some, in the worst First case, of all, who might, doesn't might care? <laughs> who who right. says, oh, a couple kids, South right? Florida. Nobody so doesn't we, care. Yeah, right. I I agree with you. Could we talk about this specifically? Is there is yes. there evidence that you know of, like that sex trafficking has sex trafficking has increased in some way that our children are more in danger than they than they've been in the past? I was just trying to look up an article I'd written, but I can't get access to it. Oh. Ironically oh, no. <laughs> enough, in the Wall Street Journal um, a couple of years ago, where I, I had interviewed David Finkelhor, who is a professor at the University of New Hampshire. You guys seem to be nodding. Maybe you've heard of him. He's uh, He's head of the Crimes Against Children Research Center. 
And I asked him, you know, what about kids being, you know, snatched? In this case, I was asking him from public, which is maybe even more likely than being snatched from their rooms. Um, he said a couple of things. He said uh, the number of children who have been taken, you know, from their parents in public when they were at an Ikea or at a Target or whatever um, and put into sex trafficking is zero in the United States. Zero. And he also said that when we think of sex trafficking, we often think of, or even kidnapping, you think of really young children. But um, more often, it's it's a relationship that is built between um, an unhappy kid, you know, teen or tween, often in very distressing circumstances already, like a bad foster care placement. Um, and then this is this is a way out that turns out to be horrendous. Uh, but the idea that kids are being snatched willy nilly off the streets or from their beds is not upheld by the FBI or the statistics that I read. Wow. I am something we've talked a lot about or been talking about is that there is sort of this false sense of security that if you can control for that totally unlikely scenario that somehow then you can relax about any other sort of risk and it might actually blind you to what is actually dangerous, which are maybe more of these like these familial or friend, like these trusted relationships that are just not even on your radar because what you are, what you're, what right, you're watching right. for are like kidnappers. <laughs> yeah. Know? I feel like we did get pointed in the wrong direction with the whole stranger danger emphasis. Yeah. Um, what I learned from a guy actually who was training the Boy Scouts, I guess not a moment too soon, although both my kids were Boy Scouts and I love that organization. Oh. Um, so uh, what they teach them, what they teach the boys and what I teach everybody else is that since the vast majority of crimes against children are committed by people that they know, friends of the family or family members, even siblings, the the best thing to do is not to teach them stranger danger, but to teach them the three R's. And I'll just say them here because they're so easy and I think they're really helpful. The three R's are to recognize, resist, and report. What does that mean? Recognize, teach your kid to recognize nobody can touch you where your bathing suit covers or nobody can touch you where you don't want to be touched, period. Simple as that. Recognize that nobody's allowed to touch you. Resist. Somebody tries to do it, scream, kick, you know, you know, hit them in the nuts, right? It's up to you. You can, you can be as mean as you want. You can jab them with a the scissors, right? Just run, do whatever you have to. And then um, if all else fails, or even if all else doesn't fail and somehow you've just been coerced into something horrible, uh, report. And by report, I mean... Keep the lines of communication open between you and your kid. It's like, you don't have to worry. You can always tell me, I won't be mad at you and I'll keep you safe and I'll be mm -hmm. safe too. And so that takes away the, the greatest weapon that the, you know, the seducer or the molester has, which is secrecy. So the three R's are going to keep your kid a lot safer than teaching them stranger danger. Recognize, resist, and report. And frankly, stranger danger, I mean, you know, there, there are odd tales about everything, but there was that kid in Utah, right? This Boy Scout, like 20 years ago, I don't remember his name, who was lost and everybody kept calling, you know, Brandon, Brandon, the search party went out. And every time he heard his name, he would hide because mm. he'd been told, don't talk to strangers. And finally, I guess he was starving and he came out and he's fine now. But uh, you want well, your kids to feel like they can talk to anyone. They just can't go off with anyone. Yeah. 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 That makes total um, sense. I'd love ahead, to Aubrey, talk a little bit about anxiety, anxiety more, because this feels like probably more of an everyday problem that a lot of parents are dealing with. Mm -hmm. And I, I love that you write about how, um, oftentimes we have this approach to anxiety that is very head on. Like we're going to, we're, we recognize anxiety and we're going to treat anxiety and we are very anxiety focused, which I, I can see the irony here. Like I can see all of the anxiety that I bring to parenting <laughs> kids with anxiety. Who doesn't? First of all, first of all, me too. I mean, let me just okay. say it. People think that I'm, people write to me and say like, Lenore, I'm just like you. My child is in the back with a BB gun skinning a, a squirrel. And I'm like, I'm in New York ordering pizza. You know, I am not brave like that. No. Uh, okay. <laughs> but I, I really love this idea that build, you can sort of approach anxiety from this. It feels like kind of like the back door that you could actually <laughs> use these skills to really build confidence. And that that could actually heal a lot of the anxiety in a way that feels so energizing and empowering and, and maybe less draining for everybody. And, and of course there will be exceptions and, and real mental illness that needs to be dealt with. And I'm not sure that, and well, I'm sure it would, it would probably be useful, but talk about just the way the way free range parenting can build confidence and, and maybe actually even help anxiety. 
Okay, so we're going to talk about anxiety in kids and in parents because I think they're okay. connected, right? So, yeah. um, so Free Range Kids grew into the nonprofit Let Grow, and Let Grow has two. I don't know what you call them, school initiatives. And all our materials are free because we're a nonprofit. And one of the two, the, the big two things that I'm hoping will literally change our culture, uh, one of them is called the Let Grow Experience. What's that? Mm -hmm. That's when kids in school every month get a homework assignment that says, go home and do something new with your parents' permission, but without your parents. Got to go do something new on your own. And it's for K through, well, right now it's for K through eight, but we're busy writing the high school version of it too. Oh, but that's great. And, and different kids are all going to be different in different neighborhoods. So it's going to be different stuff. You know, uh, there might be a 12 year old who's scrambling eggs for the first time. And there might be a kindergartner who's, you know, bringing coffee to mom, having ground them <laughs> with her teeth, whatever. So the, <laughs> the, the sole purpose is to make, well, there's, I guess it's dual purposes, but for us, the quiet unspoken purpose is for the parents to see just how competent their kids can be. Because in this culture where we're told, you know, kid walks to you know school, he's going to be kidnapped and the kid, you know, goes to baseball, he's going to be molested and the kid does homework alone, they're going to get an F. Um, all these things have been um, shoved down our throats to the point where we really are with our kids all the time and we don't know what they can do on their own because we're always there mm -hmm. to help them. So when a whole school does this, it does many things at once. It pushes the parent to let go, right? They have to. It's a homework assignment. And it gives them a little less guilt or worry because like everybody's doing it, right? I'm not the crazy mom. Everybody's letting their kid do something new. And it gives them everybody else to talk to, right? And so when everybody is doing this and the kids start walking to school or going for ice cream or mowing the lawn or making the pancakes, the parents get this jolt. And I was just talking about it this morning with a, with a TV producer because it's, they, the amount of joy <laughs> you get, you guys have four kids, when you see that your kid does something without you, unprompted, oh my God, you know, they they sent grandma a thank you card, or they put their dish in the sink after their sleepover, or, you know, they took their brother to soccer. That kind of stuff is the reward of being a parent, right? Not the every day getting up, getting them yeah. into the car, getting into the car seat, you know, that's not fun. <laughs> Fun is when you sign, finally realize like what they are capable of doing. And that, seeing the kid come back from running the errand is, is so exciting. It's the relief from that anxiety you're talking about. Mm -hmm. I mean, anxiety can get to the point where you are doing everything with your child because if you don't, you're really worried that something terrible, it doesn't even have to be specific, something terrible will happen. It's like we're watching our kids all the time because we're mm -hmm. afraid of everything. And then in comes this intervention, almost a psychological intervention that says, no, you cannot watch. They have to yeah. go around the corner without you. You have to stay home and you have to wait for 30 minutes until they come back. And they still forgot to get the cream cheese, whatever it is. Right. <laughs> but, but when that kid comes back, you are so relieved because you have seen the other side, which is without doing the compulsive activity, mm -hmm. your kid was nonetheless not only yeah. fine, but thriving. Yeah. And I really think it's, it's the relief of a breakthrough. It's, it does the trick. Yeah. So, and what about from, oh, sorry, go ahead. No. So I was just going to say it, you know, it's free, it's easy. It, yeah. You know, you can do it through your school or you can do it with a bunch of friends. I mean, I always think something is easier when you do it with other people, not just yourself. Yes. Yes. So you you're, feel you're, that judgment. Right, right, right. So, so you're freed of a lot of your anxiety. Um, but there was a study done by a guy named Camilo Ortiz. He's a professor of psychology at Long Island University who had been hearing me talk and he liked the idea of the let grow experience. And he decided to use it in, you know, do a pilot study. He's a, a, a regular old psychologist, child psychologist, as well as a professor. And so he recruited four families whose kids had um, anxiety, a diagnosis even of anxiety. And um, he did this in five sessions. The first session, he just met with the parents. And he talked to them about what I've been talking about with you, the importance of independence and how it really is a transformative thing. And then he found out from the parents what the kids, you know, why were they coming to him, right? And one family was because the kid was so nervous. He was 10 years old. He wouldn't go upstairs or downstairs in his house in the suburbs mm -hmm. without a parent. 
And one girl was so nervous, um, another 10 year old actually, she wouldn't sleep in her own bed all night. She was just too scared. And so the parents came with these different, you know, problems. And then the second week he would meet with the kids and the parent. And rather than saying, I hear you're afraid to walk up and down the stairs yourself, Sonny, how about tonight? You go upstairs and you wait there for five minutes, which is what normal exposure therapy would be, cognitive behavioral therapy. You think it's going to be, you know, too scary. How was it? Well, five minutes was okay. Okay. How about tomorrow? We do 10 minutes. He didn't do that at all. He didn't even talk about their problem. He just said, you know, your parents are here, you know, you're ready for some independence. You're 10. What are some things that you'd like to do on your own that you haven't done yet? And weirdly, even these anxious kids had things that I guess their anxious parents wouldn't let them do, like walk home from school, or this one 10-year-old wanted to, mm -hmm. A, wanted to walk home from school. He also wanted to take the Long Island Railroad, the commuter railroad, and some other stuff. So his assignment, the, the assignment that Camillo gave these kids was every day or every other day, you have to do something new on your own. And so the the 10-year-old who was afraid to go up and downstairs to the house, one night, one, one time he decided his project would be to walk home from school. And his mom, back to the mom, Aubrey, was so nervous that she took the day off work. <laughs> she just, it was just driving her crazy, literally. <laughs> and so she waited and waited and waited by the window. And guess who shows up? Her son. And, you know, and he was happy and fine. And then she was happy and fine. And then the next night when he went home, you know, walked home from school, she didn't have to take the day off work. And then he wanted to take the railroad and he took the, the Long Island Railroad four stops, which at some point I will actually compute. It's probably 10 miles. And he did that by himself and he did other things by himself. And without noticing it, he also started going up and down stairs in his house mm -hmm. by himself. And this was all over the summer wow. between fifth and sixth grade. And, in, and then along comes the first day of middle school. And because our culture turns everything into a big deal and tries to create anxiety where there doesn't have to be any, the school sent home and out, oh, it's the first day of school, a huge transition for your children. How could anybody ever manage it? You're certainly welcome to come with them because they're going to be getting a locker and a homeroom teacher <laughs> and a combination. And so come on, parents, if you want to come or if, you're, if your kid wants you to come, we understand which is a way that we normalize the idea that kids can't handle anything and that parents always mm -hmm. need to be with them. But this kid, five weeks of his, three, I guess four weeks of therapy and the one week of parents without him, um, told his parents, actually, no, I, I can handle this. It's just the first day wow. of school. I'm excited. And when he came home, it was great. He had a good time. And he said, and guess what? I was like one of the only kids there without my parents. Wow. Wow. So um, therapists out there, A, Camillo wrote a whole... Um, therapy manual that's also free that you can get on our site, which is Let Grow. It's called Independence Therapy. And now we're calling up clinics because they're hoping to, uh, he and another clinician are hoping to do, uh, to get an NIH grant to study this with, you know, a bigger population, a randomized controlled study of kids with anxiety, some being treated, you know, with talk therapy, cognitive behavioral therapy, drug therapy, and then independence therapy. And if independence therapy- wow works even as well, it's still better because it's really fast. It's five weeks. There's no drugs involved and um, kids like it. It's like, what would you like to do? Oh, you want to go on a picnic with your friends? Go. Yeah. Well, and it simultaneously is training the parents. I, that's what I loved about it. Like, oh, this is an exposure for the parents and this is really fun for the kid. Yes, exactly. Yeah. It, it's true. You know, there's this, um, there's this cool program that's out of Yale. I think it's called Space. Uh, it's not a space program, but it is a therapist who will only treat the parents of anxious kids. He never even wants to see the kid. But in that mm -hmm. case, you're teaching the parent not to accommodate their fears. But this is actually sort of one step further. And I would say funner. It's like, hey, kid, you know, yeah. today you're you're ready for something new. Let's hear. Yeah. Yeah. Mm, that's really cool. Let me ask you um, something that's been coming up for me that's sort of like a moral quandary in a sense where... I, you know, I really buy into what you're saying and I've tried, you know, with some success to uh, implement this parenting style in my own, in my own parenting. But there's also the fact which I, or, or, you know, and feel free to correct me if I'm wrong here. Um, but it seems to me that while promoting these ideas is probably really important and will benefit many, many, many more families than it hurts, there will be the, those rare cases where there is an abduction or there is a child that gets hit by a car or has some other adverse event that would not have happened had the parent done the done the helicoptering. Um, and so it's like this 
it's this tough thing where we want to we we want to get this message out there because it is going to be so beneficial and it's going to decrease depression and anxiety for so many kids and improve their relationships and their independence and everything else. And yet there is, I mean, the word that's coming to mind is the collateral damage of these, um, of these really good ideas in a way. And it's like, yeah. I I'm hesitant. I'm hesitant to want to like get the word out because of, and this is my own OCD. And by the way, I, I, I am diagnosed uh -huh. with OCD. Um, oh, how interesting. it's like, I, yeah, but I want, I want whatever we're doing to be morally perfect, you know? And so like, I'm like, yeah. oh, tell, man. Me, tell me when you can get something morally perfect and we'll do it. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> right. I mean, yeah. what you're asking for yeah. is, is there some way of saying that nothing bad will ever happen if we pay hmm. complete and utter attention? And I can't even say that. I mean, you know, there are kids who are hit by cars when they're holding their mother's hand and crossing the crosswalk. So there's no such thing as perfect safety. And it's sort of weird to assume there could be. I mean, I can't mm -hmm. I can't imagine any circumstance under which nothing adverse would ever occur, whether you're always with your kids or never with your kids. I mean, can you? No. Yeah. In reality, no. I mean, the, 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 the closest thing I'm coming up with is just like the padded room. You know, right. The and, padded and, room. And when you yeah. take it to the when you take it to logical extreme, obviously you can sort of like take the other side to the logical extreme was which is how mentally and emotionally damaging something like that would be you know mm -hmm. right I, you know and the other thing to think about is like what we're defining is if we only take enough care um nothing bad will happen it's like well to me the first step for taking enough care to make sure nothing to 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 drastically um lower the number of children killed is you could never drive them anywhere hmm Right. If you're ever putting your child in a car to go anywhere, you're taking the biggest risk in terms of numbers of anything other than, you know, congenital defects and, you know, heart disease and cancer, because the number one way kids die is as passengers in cars, not as pedestrians, not as mm. bikers. So, um, you know, if you really want to go to the extreme, forget about the padded room, just walk, every, have them walk mm. everywhere. Mm. Yeah, that makes sense. What, so what? For a, for a parent who recognizes, look, like I, I'm on the anxious side of the spectrum, but I want to mm -hmm. do, I want to do this better. Like I want, I want my kids not to not die, but to have a full life. Mm -hmm. Is there, is there some kind of like quick gut check that you would recommend when, when there's a decision to be made? Like, am I okay with letting my whatever year old child walk home alone from school? You know, so what, what is it? What's a good question, reflection question that a parent can ask when they're trying to make this decision that will help them sort of figure out where this experience is going to land on the life or death scale? You know, the, is it, is it worth the well, risk because right. of so, the independence that it will give them? Okay. Nothing is worth the risk if you're defining the risk as death. So you first have to recognize that this is new, this idea of there's a scale. And on the one side, it's, independence and confidence and resourcefulness and resilience and other times but they could die <laughs> but they could die it's i'm i'm you know i don't know if people can see this or not but my it's it's always going to win and so yeah there's two things i would say one is to recognize that that while that feels innate and i'm sure the ocd stuff feels innate too so much is cultural your your grandparents mm -hmm. were not thinking well i'd like her to milk the cows but what if she gets hit by their yeah. hoof and dies. I mean, we didn't put everything into an oh, if wow. and you know, what if scenario, cost benefit. And and our current cost benefit is always death on the other side of the scale. And that's why we can't move. It's just weighs a yes. million pounds oh. and nothing yes. will budget. So first of all, recognize that that's a cultural tick. And that's really what I'm trying to change, especially through wow. The, this whole idea of exposure to reality, which is actually my kid walked to school and it was fine. Um, wow. That's my, that's the thing that interests me. But in terms of like, what can you do for a gut check? Um, I'm going to say two things. One is, what did I do at that age? Is my kid really so much okay. stupider than me <laughs> that they can't look both ways, right? That they can't say, oh no, I'm not going to get in the car with you. They, they're, they're just as smart as you, especially it's your job to train them, right? And the other thing is I really, I mean, why do I push the let grow experience free, free, free for all schools everywhere for eternity that you just press a button and get all sorts of information. It's because when you're pushed to do it almost by a third party, which is the teacher is sending the kids home with the homework, do something on your own. 
And when everyone else is doing it, it's way easier than me asking myself every step of the way, is it okay for him to walk to the tree? Can he walk from the tree to the sewer? Can he walk from the sewer to home? That's just too hard. So do it as a group, a collective mm -hmm. problem. And right now we're talking about a collective problem because my mom didn't think that way when I was walking to school. Oh, I'd like her to get fresh air, but what if she dies? Oh, it'd be good for her <laughs> to learn her directions, but what if she dies? That was just not a thing. Yeah. So it's a collective problem. I'd say it's a culture of OCD and we need this exposure therapy to reality as a group. Yeah, love that. Uh, as you know, Lenore, most of the conversations that we have on this podcast are faith related in some way. I'm curious if you have thoughts on how uh, how faith or people of faith or religious communities might be able to play a role in in helping uh, kids, helping let let kids grow a little bit more. First of all, I'd say anyone with faith is already so lucky and ahead of the game um, because it gives you this totally different perspective. It's not all you, right? God works in mysterious ways. You know, there are things that we'll never know, you know, blessings in disguise. They're called, they're not called good things in disguise. Mm. They're mm. blessings in disguise. And once you recognize that it's, you know, you love your child and you're doing your best by your child, but your child was given to you by God and God has a lot of say in what happens next. It's a relief. I mean, it's really sort of taking the, the, the illusion of control off of you. And people think control is what gives you peace of mind, but I don't think so. Um, yeah. You know, it's, if you're in control and something bad happens, it's all your fault. And that is, I think, one of the things that is driving parents crazy today, because yeah. we do think that we can control literally everything in our kids' lives, from every bite they eat, it has to be, you know, a superfood, and every book they read has to be educational, and every friend they have has to be vetted. I mean, it's just, there's a lot of assumptions that we can control for everything. But if you take a step back and go, you know... I'm not going to be lazy and I'm not going to be dumb, but I'm also not going to think I'm God. That's, that's going to help. That's so that. powerful. Yeah. Um, before we let you go, I, the, the fear part two for me is, <laughs> is about that community piece. I, when I really think about putting this into practice, I mean, I, I, I feel, I feel totally bought in and I imagine a lot of a lot of parents do, but there's this fear of the confrontation of your community. And so, so how do you explain this to someone who is suspicious? And my favorite line in your whole book was something about <laughs> hell hath no fury, like a, a secretly conflicted and self-righteous parent or something. I it just made me laugh. So hard like me. <laughs> I, I know that feeling. I think this probably happens in, in circles of parents. And so what, what could you say, like, what's an easy way to explain your intention with let grow? And if you're a parent, who's going to really try to embrace it, um, who, who is imagining a potential conversation with a neighbor <laughs> or a friend, what's a quick way to say, this is what I'm, why I'm doing this. Uh, not Lenore said so. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, mean, I heard this woman once this on a book. podcast. Yes. Right? <laughs> She's kind of yeah. whiny, but, um, uh, first of all, I would always suggest doing any of these things at first with friends, you know, oh, you guys wow. have some neighbors yeah. or cousins or brother-in-law. And it's like, even if you just are, you're going to be inside and the kids have to be outside during brunch, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. even that is just a beginning for everybody to start saying, wow, that was really the best brunch we've had in 10 years, you know, and you can't come in and ask me for, a, and, and maybe a 15 year old is out there, you know, adjudicating the disputes or telling the kids, <laughs> forget it. So um, do it with friends. Uh, you can always tell them that you're doing what we talked about at the beginning. I'm trying to prepare my child for the past instead of yes. always being there clearing the path for my child. Um, yeah. Secondly, you may be right. Just give them that. <laughs> that's, that's what we, <laughs> we were told to write back. I used to be an, uh, an opinions uh, writer at a newspaper. And uh, to all the people who wrote to us in fury, we were just supposed to write back, you may be right. Or, <laughs> they that. have a point. Right? <laughs> they just want to be heard. Right? Yeah. yeah. So that's it. And then, you know, to yourself, you can be saying, my kid is going to be your kid's boss. I think that's that's probably the perfect place to end right there. There um, you go. Thank you yeah. so much, Lenore. This has been really awesome. Is I there... knew it would be fun. How did I know? I knew this was going to be a good one. Yes, yeah, thank is. you. Is, are there any particular resources or any parts of your work you'd like to point people to specifically? Yes. Um, so the book is Free Range Kids. But to put it into practice, go to letgrow.org. 
If you're a parent, you can take the quote unquote pledge of pledge of independence and we send one little idea a week for 10 weeks of ways that you can let go a little. Um, but I'd really recommend trying to get your school to start the let grow experience, which as I said, is free. And also we, we recommend that schools stay open before or after school for mixed age, no devices, free play, because there's really no chance for kids. Well, maybe there is in Utah, but so few kids go home, throw their backpack on the floor and run back outside. Um, and even if they do, there's often not other kids outside. So this is a way to have a bunch of kids just staying at school playing, right? They have chalk, they have balls, and they have, um, a, you know, a teacher or somebody who's watching over it, who's not organizing the games and not solving the disputes. So you have sort of a, you know, like a wildlife sanctuary of what the old days of childhood used to be. So that's just another easy way to give your kids some independence. There was something I, I desperately wanted to mention. Utah, Utah, we forgot oh, yes. to mention. Utah is one of my favorite states for this reason. Uh, your state was the first to pass uh, what we now call a reasonable childhood independence law. Back then it was called the free range parenting law. Um, yeah. And it says that neglect is when you put your kid in obvious and serious danger, not any time you take your eyes off them. And that it's good for kids to be able to do some things on their own. And the, the old age old activities of childhood, like walking to school and playing outside or staying home alone, even those are not against yeah. the law. You will not be investigated for them unless it's a you know, two year old or something obviously unreasonable and dangerous. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. I, I um, remember the relief of just realizing if I think it's reasonable, then it's OK. I, no, yep. you're, no, you're not going to have to explain yourself in. I don't know. I was always afraid there would be some technicality that I wasn't aware of. And it, this law felt like such a, a real loosening of that and just like trust your instincts and be reasonable. And it's not more complicated than that. Yeah. Thank it's you so me. much for your work. This is, you've been a real influence for us and, in, um, and okay. hope to <laughs> continue to, uh, loosen up a little bit. I yeah. Think we're going to try half that's, of our that's kids. the best we could say. Yeah. <laughs> You're going to send me a little note in, no, let's say three weeks saying, I can't believe it. I don't know where my kids are now. I feel so happy and I'll see them at yes. five. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Yep. That's where part two is going. Yep. Cool. Okay. Thank you. Again, All right. Lenore. Thank this you. So nice Thank you guys. Thank right. you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Yeah. Bye. All right. Thanks so much for listening. We really hope that you enjoyed this conversation with Lenora Skenazy. You can find out more about her work at letgrow.org. And if Faith Matters content is resonating with you and you get the chance, we would love for you to leave us a review on Apple Podcasts or whatever platform you listen on. We read all of the reviews and it really helps us to get the word out about Faith Matters and we appreciate the support. Thanks again for listening and remember you can check out more at faithmatters.org.